Hey guys, welcome to another server video. This will serve as kind of an ending chapter for this part of the server build. I plan to do more content surrounding servers, Proxmox, ZFS, and all the other things in the future, but I thought it'd be nice to have a sort of rounding off video for all the things I discussed going into this server build. So this video will be mainly some storage talk and after that, some performance numbers. I'll have jump links in the description if you'd rather skip through the video to the topics that interest you. First up, I changed the disk layout somewhat. I got a hand on 10 3 terabyte enterprise SAS disks. They are a bit older, but not as old as my 2 terabyte disks I used before. I also had 10 so I put 8 in a RAID Z2 pool, so that gave me 18 terabytes of storage, and I still have two spare disks left if one of them breaks in the future. That means I now have 8 times 10 terabyte in a mirror pool for 40 terabyte net, and 8 times 3 terabyte in a RAID Z2 for 18 terabyte net. And next to that, I have two single 4 terabyte disks. One of them is for doing some random stuff and the other is for my IP camera footage. That really doesn't need any redundancy, so using a single disk is most efficient. I also have a few SSDs in the machine, totaling about five terabytes without redundancy. All in all, I'm very happy with the server build, and this amount of storage should last me quite a while. Back to those new three terabyte disks though. Those are HDST Ultrastar 7K 4000 disks. I've used those in enterprise storage systems before, and after needing a firmware update for my Seagate Ironwolf 10TB disks, I looked into firmware updates for these drives too. I stumbled across a very helpful topic on the Serve the Home forum and using SG tools, which are kind of generic SCSI SAS tooling, I was able to flash all the drives with the most recent firmware. Instead of explaining to you in this video how to exactly do that, I'll have the post linked in the description, but if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. Next, I wanted to make these older drives use a little bit less power if possible. Per drive, these draw about two times as much as the 10 terabyte Ironwolf drives. The three terabyte HTST drives being SAS drives though, they have a lot more configurable options than the normal SATA drives. One of those modes was a special low power plus low RPM mode. That means the disks don't have to spin down and up completely, but can lower their RPM at times where there isn't a lot going on. Excellent. There is again an excellent forum post on this on the Serve the Home forum about how to do this yourself. Again, I've linked it in the description. Something else I'd like to highlight is that people often ask me how powerful their power supply needs to be to run a large amount of drives. Well, I generally tell them it needs to be powerful enough to take the peak of each disk being started all at the same time. Using the SAS backplane and SAS or modern SATA drives though, there are more options available. Although I didn't load the BIOSes for my Avago LSI controller cards, if you do, you can configure a feature called staggered spin-up. Both the Seagate iRemove 10 terabyte drives and the HTST drive support this while in the backplane of this server. What this allows you to configure is how many drives can spin up at the same time. As you can see in the video, I have it set to two drives at the same time, so that the hit on the power supply will be a bit lower. You'll see in the video that there's four drives spinning at the same time, but that's because I have two Avago LSI controllers and they each spin up two disks at the same time. Oh yeah, as you can see in that example, I've moved the server. It used to be in my office in the garage, but those HTST SAS drives just use too much power and thus become too hot to cool when turning down the fans. If you've watched my video about replacing the fans in this chassis, it isn't really loud using the Noctua fans, but it's still louder than I'd like in that room. So I prepared a special spot in my garage, made a little patch panel with four patches, and moved the server to there. In the garage, it's no problem that it hums a little bit because there are other devices which actually make more noise in the garage, so that drowns it out nicely. A quick note about the Seagate iRemove 10 terabyte drives. These drives are of the newer variant that if they detect 3.3 volt on the SATA power connector, 
they won't spin up. Now, a lot of YouTubers describe this as a problem or fault or whatever, but this is actually a feature, as I explained earlier, that with which you can enable staggered spin up. So using this chassis and compatible controllers, which the motherboard isn't, this actually works perfectly. So the controller is in charge if the drive spins up inside of the backplane or not. And this is basically done by toggling the 3.3 volt going to the drive or not. And well, your motherboard ports cannot do that in combination with this backplane. So although the reverse breakout cable works fine, and I use it on my uh, four terabyte disks and SSDs, if you have modern drives, this could be an issue if your controller, as I said, doesn't trigger the power on sequence. And well, there's enough videos and guides on YouTube on how to modify the drives so that basically this power pin gets disabled. Um, but just to know, this is actually a feature instead of a bug or a problem. Oh, and on a side note, after my firmware update for the Seagate Ironwolf 10TB drives, which is now officially available on their website for download, the drives have worked flawlessly and I'm really happy with them in regards to excellent performance, noise and power usage. I can really recommend them, especially if you actually expect some disk performance out of your storage solution instead of just being used as, well, bulk storage devices on which you mostly store and don't actually manipulate the data on. Speaking of that, Let's take a quick look at some performance metrics. Using DD, writing non-compressed data to the 8 times 10 terabyte pool gives me about 800 megabytes a second. That might be slower than what it would be if I used RAID Z2, for instance, but for a mirror pool, which will be able to do more IOPS, that's pretty good. That means per mirror, we're getting about 200 megabytes a second, and well, each disk inside of that mirror is doing 200 megabytes a second, so that's 400 megabytes a second. So with four sets in total, that gives me 800 megabytes a second of actual throughput speed, while it is actually writing 1.6 gigabytes a second on the back end to the disks. Reading is also getting around 800 megabytes a second, Getting the benefit from having two disks inside of the mirror and how random I.O. is affected is really hard to simulate with DD. So I'm going to leave that in the middle for now. If anyone knows a benchmark which is easily comparable with other systems and runs on Linux, let me know down in the comments because there's some stuff out there but I haven't really found anything good to use and that we can use to compare. Oh, all these tests have been done without SSD-based ZIL S-Log or L2ARC active on the dataset that's being tested. To see raw performance, what the back end of the storage subsystem is capable of, I started a scrub on both the 8x10TB and 8x3TB pool at the same time. Generally, the scrub runs at 2.5 to 3 gigabytes a second, and adding some flash pools to the mix, that makes it peak over 4 gigabytes a second, which is really awesome for this little desktop AM4 AMD platform I'm running this on. No performance bottlenecks there. So that's all well and all in regards to performance and my disks, but in my previous videos I mentioned I would add a mirrored ZIL or S-Log and an NVMe L2 ARC to the system. For generic workloads though, those really don't do that much. So I'm going to be a bit short about this topic. Yeah. The ZIL S-Log mainly helps with the VMs I run on the system over NFS. I'm using the mirrored Seagate Ironwolf SSDs for that, and those have power loss protection, which makes them very well suitable. And well, that's been working great. They have a very high write endurance rating, and since I've really over-provisioned them, they should last quite a while, and performance has been very good. Then, as I mentioned, I also have the L2 ARC, but I don't use that in a regular sense. I've partitioned the drive and divided the available space over the two HDD pools. Then, since I'm using lots of ZFS datasets, I have specified where I want L2ARC to only cache metadata or where to cache everything like its default setting. And then I've made some changes to the L2ARC settings, lifting some restrictions it has in regards to write speed and what it will cache by default. That basically means that it will now cache, well, anything on the data sets where it's enabled. Now, this is mostly done for my video production workflow. During ingesting of all the footage, 
basically all the data gets written to the 8 times 10 terabyte pool, but also gets stored on the NVMe cache or L2 arc drive. Once I start editing, most of this data is available from the L2 arc cache, so basically I'm editing with NVMe speed and latency. Even though the data set might be too big to fit in memory, especially if I've been working on multiple projects at the same time, it'll fit on the L2 arc NVMe cache. So yeah, there is a bandwidth limit in regards to running it locally or over the network. I have a one gigabyte per second limit because of the 10 gigabit network link, but I do get the advantage of using NVMe uh, latency instead of having to access the footage from a mechanical hard drive, even though that's a mirror pool, etc. And this basically works automatically for any project I'm working on. So I have my drive redundancy and backups, etc., running on my server, but I can also edit at near or basically the same speed as if it would be on my local NVMe storage. Okay, I'm stopping this topic here. I didn't really want to go into this for this video, and this is long enough for this part. If you guys are interested, make sure to mention that in the comments, and I'll make a separate video about it with maybe a little tutorial. But remember, I'm kind of abusing the ZFS caching mechanics here, and it's a bit of an unorthodox way. And if you think that, you know, you know where to find me in the comments. So just let me know. Moving on, the last thing I wanted to mention is network performance. As you might know, uh, prior in the series, I kind of ran out of PCIe lanes because I'm using a desktop board. So my 10 gigabit NIC will be limited. And during testing between my workstation and server, this limit did indeed show up. Here in the dmessage log, you can clearly see that the Intel network card is only using two PCIe generation two lanes, which is about one gigabyte a second, but because of the overhead with PCIe generation two, that equates to about six, 650 megabytes a second in reality. But the fix for this was always in the back of my mind. Basically, once the server was fully up and running, I just pull out the graphics card. That made it so that the bottom slot had the full times four PCIe 2.0 lanes, and thus 10 gigabit was achieved without a problem. And well, it's been running like that ever since. I haven't had a single crash or issue or anything like that, and it's been perfect. Performance is great, and over the past month, I've been using it to do my live edits, to run my Demotica VMs and a lot of VMs I run. And well, it's just running great. <laughs> and so the project of building the new server is kind of finished. Or is it? Well, as it turns out, yes, the server, this server is finished, but the whole setup is only getting started. I haven't really mentioned this before, but I've been getting a lot of requests to do some tutorials about running Home Assistant on Proxmox, for instance. And while in its basic form, that's actually quite easy, so I might do that in the future, I'm thinking of going a bit further. Since a lot of stuff in my house is controlled by the Modica, and it goes, well, <laughs> it goes completely haywire when it goes down. I've been thinking of making Home Assistant highly available. I've kind of had this in the back of my mind during this whole project. And basically there's two ways to achieve this. You can either run with more expensive or older enterprise hardware, which will have a better uptime in the event of component failure, or make the setup highly available with multiple cheaper or simpler nodes. I've gone the second route and I currently have a four node Proxmox cluster running and I'm experimenting with the best way to keep a highly available home assistant installation in the air. So basically H-A-H-A, -A -A. highly available home assistant or home assistant highly available. You can expect more about that in future videos. Well, that's kind of where I wanted to leave this for now. If you think I forgot or dropped a topic during this series, please let me know down in the comments below and I can either answer you or maybe do another video about it. Other than that, thank you again for watching. I know this was a long one. Hopefully you are subscribed and throw this video a like. Whatever the case, I hope to see you back for the next video. Bye bye.